Imagine living your life after 50 and feeling energized and excited about your future. Welcome to the Women in the Middle podcast, the podcast for women who are ready to figure out what they want and create the life they deserve. Here's your host and master certified life coach, Susie Rosenstein. Hey there, welcome back to the podcast, Women in the Middle. I'm your host, Susie Rosenstein, and I am so glad to be here with you again for this week's episode, which is all about looking at memorabilia and things that are turning 50 and why we care. (laughs) Today, we're talking specifically about some pretty iconic memories you probably have from your childhood, things and events that have grown up right along with you and are hitting the big milestone this year, the big 5-0. We'll also be talking about why we're talking about it. What I mean is why we care about nostalgia and memories like this in the first place. So interesting, right? That's what we're talking about today. I know you're going to love going down memory lane with me, and I can't wait. But before we go way back together, I just wanted to remind you that I have a free Facebook group with your name on it. I'm not sure if you know that I have a place to go to continue this conversation. It's called the Women in the Middle Community, and it's where we keep talking about what's on the podcast and basically how to love your life after 50. Now, of course, we still love you if you're not quite 50. So if you're pushing 50, or if you're just over 50, it's all good. Come on in. Just get in there with us. We're waiting for you. So just go to www.facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash women in the middle community and click join. I can't wait to welcome you into the group. Okay, so let's get going. Every year, you read about all the people and events and things that are turning some milestone birthday, often 50. And I just love articles like this, so I tend to look for them. This year, a few things on the list really caught my eye, so I thought it would be fun to take a closer look at what nostalgia, memorabilia, and events like this mean to you. This year seems to be a good one, too. Lots of cool things from your childhood are turning 50 in 2019. So... I started thinking a lot about memorabilia in general since I've been in my 50s. That is for five years or so. Now, what's happened for me was that I was on a trip back home to Lansdale, Pennsylvania, and I was greeted with a big pile of boxes full of stuff from my past. It was taking up a lot of space in my mom's attic, and she asked me to go through everything and take it home or throw it out that it was time. Has that happened to you? (laughs) I mean, it's pretty reasonable because I was about 50. (laughs) Now, I was pretty excited too. I walked into the room where it was all waiting for me and I was immediately overwhelmed in a good way. Memories started flooding back. I knew it was going to take a few hours and that was okay. One box at a time, I found all kinds of stuff. I found shoes that were quite interesting. I found my favorite clogs from high school. They were burgundy with a little chain, and I thought I was super cool when I wore them back then. There were other shoes, too. My first boots with heels. Again, I felt cool. And a coveted pair of red Dr. Scholl's sandals, that kind with that horrible wooden sole. <laughs> you know, they didn't look comfortable, but back in the day, they, we loved them, right? We thought they were super comfortable. Anyway, I couldn't believe it, but my old tap shoes from junior high were even in that pile of stuff. Now, none of the shoes fit anymore because my feet grew about uh, a half inch or so when I had kids. I'm sure yours did too. Um, But anyway, it was totally fun to have them and just to see them again. Another big surprise was all of my old calligraphy work. Now, I discovered calligraphy when I was 12. Actually, it was the year my father died. Someone supporting our family used a calligraphy pen to write like normally he had it in his pocket. And so he wrote something to me and I I saw it. I was like, oh, my God, what is this? I, I was unbelievably enchanted with all of it. I'd never seen anything like it. It was a proper pen with ink, like one of those nibs. So he sent me my first pen in ink and I practiced my heart out for years. I remember practicing, but what I found was pads and pads of all of this practicing paper. So some of it I needed to draw lines on, and some of it um, had the lines already, but it was just alphabets and alphabets and alphabets, so much practice. I remember I got a couple of gigs, like I did a couple of um, 
addressing envelopes. And one time I had a really fancy gig doing a placard for a restaurant downtown. I don't remember how this came about, but (laughs) I didn't remember all the practice. So I really liked seeing that I took it so seriously and that I practiced so much. But one of the best memories from all that stuff was also related to communication. (laughs) But unlike calligraphy, it was about the handwritten notes that we used to pass. Basically, the texts of days gone by. That's how we texted, right? (laughs) They were handwritten notes and letters and cards and pen pals and, oh my God, hundreds of them. Even a couple of steamy ones. And I found a diary too. And when I cracked that thing open, I was reminded of what took up so much of my time back then, thinking about and writing about boys. So much drama, but so many memories. I don't remember a lot about all these boys I was writing about, (laughs) but I could not believe the notes. I mean, you remember we used to pass them in the hallways and also at the end of the day, but there were hundreds and hundreds of them. So. What would you do if you found a treasure trove like this? Would you just enjoy the moment and then throw them out? Would you photograph some of the things and letters and notes before you threw them out? Or would you selectively edit but bring a lot home and not throw much out at all? (laughs) Now, I'm quite sentimental and I must say a lot of it came home 500 miles, schlepped it back in the car. It is hard for me to throw things out from my past. Now, decluttering is getting more and more airtime these days. Lots of people are talking about decluttering, lots of books and shows on cable. But I think you'll agree that family memorabilia is a little different than throwing out regular old stuff. Family and personal memorabilia has a different meaning, I think, than the other stuff you might be keeping around. And as I said, I have a hard time throwing stuff out from my childhood. I think about why, why that is. And as we know from the thought work that we talk about in the podcast, the reason you do or don't do things is because of how you feel or how you think it'll make you feel. And for me, I think it has a lot to do with the fact that both of my parents died so young. I've made an association that stuff from my past is comforting in some way, that it's good to have visual reminders, and that these thoughts create feelings for me of comfort and stability. And then those are the feelings that are related to my decision not to throw too much out. So much of life is unpredictable and unstable, and seeking out stability is comforting for me. It's something I do on purpose. Having things from my past seems to relate to all of this somehow. It's part of my story, especially because I don't live close to where I grew up. It helps me weave together my past in some way. Or, I think it does. (laughs) And like I said, you know how the thought model helps us understand and gives us perspective. And the perspective here is that the stuff is just stuff. Even personal and family memorabilia is stuff and stuff is neutral. Then you have thoughts about it. And those thoughts create feelings, not the stuff. It's just really good to remember this. It really makes no sense in the here and now when you really think about it. The stuff ends up going into extra, an extra closet space or a crawl space or a basement for storage. It doesn't have magical powers. My thoughts are what create comfort and feelings about stability, not the stuff. Now, I did something fun, though. When I came home with all this stuff, I started to make a few little videos about looking at all of it a bit more closely. And I called the little series, What's in Susie's Closet? (laughs) So one at a time, I would pull out one of these items from the 70s, and I would talk about what it was and what memories it brought back. So I'll include a link in the show notes if you wanna check it out. It's pretty funny. Like I found a bunch of those tiny little wallet-sized photos. Remember those? We used to share them. We used to write a little note and then share them with our friends. Nobody does that anymore. Um, I found a whole slew of negatives. Remember we used to get film developed and we used to keep negatives? Oh my God, tons and tons of negatives. What do you do with them? I found uh, a book about Rocky. So growing up in Philadelphia, Rocky was a big deal. And I had this whole book about the making of the movie and all of that. So I found all kinds of cool stuff. 
So that is called What's in Susie's Closet, if you're interested. Okay, but even after all this, the stuff is still here. And when I posted some of my finds on Facebook, I learned that not everyone thinks about memorabilia this way. (laughs) In fact, one of my most treasured things from my past is my marching band jacket. I would never get rid of this in a million years. I haven't gotten rid of it in many, many decades, and I'm certainly not going to get rid of it now. Yet, one of my good trumpet-playing friends from band responded that he got rid of his jacket. I was absolutely shocked. But there you have it. It's just proof. Not everyone thinks and feels the same way about memorabilia. Not everyone wants it around. Not everyone feels comforted by it. Many just think of it as clutter. So, how about you? What do you do with things that you find from the past? Do you keep it? Do you file it? Do you photograph it? Do you store it? Do you want to share it with your kids? Your friends from high school? Do you like thinking about the past in a fond, nostalgic way? Do you like talking about the stuff and sharing it with your kids because you think it will help them know you better and understand you better? Or do you just want to give it to them? Like, what do you want to do with it if your kids are involved? This is definitely part of it for me, the whole kid thing. It helps me tell stories and share my past. Now, I don't live where I grew up. It helps me kind of show them more about what it was like for me. And it helps me remember things. So my life was totally different from theirs. (laughs) I mean, it was so different. And I don't have a lot of stories from my parents. That's the other thing. I don't have that continued past, other people, um, you know, from way back. And I don't have those people talking about my past. And I don't have information about their past. In fact, there are gaping holes. And I would love to know more because both of my birth parents died so young. And I know I never will. Now, a lot of the people that knew them when they were young, are also gone. So this explains a lot of it for me. Um, And also why I have a full crawl space uh, that will be tons of fun to go through someday. (laughs) Hey, as a listener of this podcast, you are cordially invited if you want to come and help. Now, don't all crash the internet or my website sending me emails telling me you'll come. (laughs) But it's okay. I understand if you don't take me up on that invitation. It's all right. I'm just going to have to look for ways to make that whole thing more fun. Anyway, it does explain a lot of it for me. And it also is a reminder that everyone's different and there's really no right way or wrong way to think and feel about this sort of thing. But what's important to think about is the, you know, the way the thought model works and the way the thought model really does show you perspective. So the thing itself is neutral. Even my band jacket. My band jacket is just a bunch of of polyester fibers. (laughs) It's completely neutral. Yes, it's got band pins on it, and it does have an embroidered uh, name that says Sue hyphen (laughs) sax. I used to be Sue instead of Susie, and of course I played sax. So that's on there too, but the whole thing is neutral. Now what I make that band jacket mean to me is a whole other ballgame or football game, as we know from marching band. And I make it mean this band jacket represents an important part of my life. And the other thing about my band jacket is that I think about a mentor, uh, my big mentor from that time period, uh, one of the most special people in my life who came into my life at a time when I needed a strong, reliable man, a strong, reliable man in my life, very soon after my father died. And I'm talking about this band director, Stephen Frederick. We called him Fred, and my band jacket is not going anywhere. (laughs) It's just not. So when it comes to stuff like this, it's good to remember that it is just stuff. And knowing that you can photograph it if you want and get rid of it if you want or donate it, those are all great solutions when you're trying to clear clutter. But the other thing to think about is it creates feelings, right? You have a thought about the thing, and then you feel a certain way. Is that feeling useful for you? And if it's not useful, then you want to rethink your thinking. If it is useful, that's another whole thing. So you get to decide all of it. You do. 
Everybody's not the same and you get to make some decisions about your thoughts. So like I said, my band jacket's not going anywhere for me, but I have lots of other things I can do some thinking about and see what's going on. So remember, notice your thoughts and feelings always. They are always related. Sometimes you'll pick up on the feeling first and then you can look for the thought that's creating it. And sometimes you'll pick up on the thought first and then you can be curious about the feeling, but they're always related. Okay, now for the things that are turning 50 right along with you. I love this list. Now, like I said, there are lots of things turning 50 out there. And if you check Google, you will find tons more things than what we're going to talk about. Now, many of the same reasons as what we've discussed already um, are related to how you think and feel about personal memorabilia when we go through the list. So you'll see what's on the list. Check Google if you're super curious and want to see what else is on the list. There are many lists. And let's just go through a few of them. And I am very curious to see what you will make some of this stuff mean and what kind of memories come up for you. In any case, it'll be interesting. You are not aging alone. You're in the best company of amazing people, amazing women in the middle, and really cool events and things. So let's take a look at some of them. Let's start with one of the big ones. The 50th anniversary this year is taking place for the first manned moon landing. So Neil Armstrong became the first man on the moon. And I actually remember watching it. It was July 1969 and I was five. I remember my dad pulled me in to the living room to watch it on TV. And remember the TVs back then, they had legs. (laughs) Get, Get the whole image in your mind. And it was, he told me it was really important that he wanted me to see it. And you know what? I remember that. I remember him saying, it's really important. I want you to see this. And I was only five. Do you remember watching this on TV back then? For me, this little event, little for me, big for the man on the moon, (laughs) has even an even greater meaning because I don't remember my dad specifically telling me many things. I certainly don't have many memories from when I was five, but this memory stands out clear as day. This event is one of those events that people remember where they were. So what about you? Do you remember watching this on your black and white TV with legs? Do you remember where you were? Or not? It's curious. Okay, here's another one. Monty Python's Flying Circus. So tell me, do you know all the words to the dead parrot or the argument sketch? Who used to stay up on Saturday night and watch it on PBS? I had books of all the scripts. I continued and watched all the movies too. So the the Monty Python, the Holy Grail movie came out very soon after that. Monty Python really was a huge part of my growing up years. And it became a way for me to connect with other kids who had a similar sense of humor. Like we used to do the sketches back and forth and make all kind of Monty Python jokes. And I think it's kind of like Seinfeld and Curb Your Enthusiasm, or at least how they've been for me as an adult. And it's funny, I see my kids, they make all kinds of SpongeBob references with their friends and also the Simpsons. So I think it's kind of like that, like this whole sense of humor thing and the way you connect with other people is very important. And for me, Monty Python was it. Here's another one. One of my all-time favorite TV shows wait for it. Are you ready? 50th anniversary of the Brady Bunch. The Brady Bunch is turning 50. I didn't miss an episode. And believe it or not, I also bought the videos on eBay when my kids were young because I really wanted to watch the episodes again, all of them with them. I wanted them to have some of these references and to have the the humor, good, clean fun. So like, The same reasons I shared before, I I felt compelled. I wanted to share a TV show that meant so much to me as a kid. So it really was good, clean fun. And I got to tell you, at that point in my life, I really needed it. My mother died when I was five, and I just wanted something that was good and clean and fun. And I have to say, I, I definitely identified with it too, because both parents were coming into it with something that happened that made them single parents and they remarried. Now, I never had a blended family like that, but I definitely identified with 
a family upheaval. And these parents were so solid. They were funny, they were silly, and they always had important messages. And I related to it back then, right? It just was different. There was more of a respect for parents, (laughs) I think, back then on TV. We don't have a lot of TV shows like that around today, but I think about the Brady Bunch as comfort food. And I really identified with Marsha back then. People always told me that my 13 and 14-year-old self looked like her, too. I had the long, straight hair parted in the middle. I totally had a crush on Peter and the whole pork shop and apple shosh. Remember that whole thing? I even named my first dog, who was a chocolate wiener dog. Her name was Cindy after Cindy Brady. I loved that name. I loved Jan. I loved Bobby. I loved Greg and all their shenanigans, too. But I couldn't take my eyes off Peter. And Alice was the coolest babysitter around or housekeeper, whatever. She was like all purpose. I'll never forget that one episode with Alice. They, they had this um, school event and in the backyard and there was a dunk tank. <laughs> and somebody left a towel on the, the bar, the trigger mechanism of the whole dunk tank. So of course she's cleaning things up and she's crawling across and she grabs the towel and she triggers it and she falls into the dunk tank. And she was such a comedic actress, what she did underwater and everything. Oh, my God, it was so funny. I'll never forget that. There were so many memorable episodes and so many things about the house and the whole Brady Bunch show that were iconic, like that staircase, that time that Marsha got hit with a football and broke her nose. Oh, my nose. Oh, my God, that was so funny. And all of the groovy fashions from the 70s, the hilarity with everything these guys did, like all of the um, shows that they put on for, for school and their trips to Hawaii. I'll never forget how funny and how captivating that whole trip to Hawaii was. Oh, my God. I watched that over and over. It was so stressful because Greg had some surfing accident, but they learned how to hula and they had the lays and Then there was the absolute funniest episode. It was one of my favorite Brady Bunch episodes when Peter had that tarantula on him. (laughs) And I don't remember it being quite as funny when I watched it originally. But when I finally got the DD, of of course, I have the, um, the the whole show, all the episodes on DVD. But when I got that DVD... And I could pause it and just see how funny it was, his look of terror (laughs) with the spider. We all killed ourselves like laughing. My kids were cracking up. Anyway, the list goes on and I was along for the ride. 8 p.m. on Friday nights, must see TV. I liked it way more than The Partridge Family, which came on at 8.30. And I don't know if you know, but HGTV is restoring the iconic Brady house to its 1970s glory and reuniting the Brady cast, all six kids who are now people our age, (laughs) they're all involved and they're sharing lots of social media. They're taking you inside the house. They're talking about the renovation. The renovation is happening with all of your favorite people from HGTV too, all the designers. It is so much fun to watch. So if this is as exciting to you as it is to me, you have to make sure to check it out. And if any of you know or connected to Maureen McCormick, I think she would make an amazing guest on Women in the Middle. She is an amazing woman in the middle herself. Let me know because I would love to have her on the podcast. Okay, let's carry on now to Tic Tacs. Tic Tacs are turning 50 this year and I don't go anywhere without them in my purse. In fact, I'm not that brand loyal to much, but I have a thing about mints and I enjoy a good Tic Tac. Now, I'm a traditionalist. I pretty much stick with the mint. I don't go for those other flavors. (laughs) But I did make sure to get my kids going on Tic Tacs, too. Okay, here's another one. Sesame Street. Sesame Street is turning 52. Can you believe it? Who is your favorite character? We all grew up on Sesame Street, and you know so many of those songs. For me, I love Cookie Monster. Who didn't love Cookie Monster? (laughs) I just love those googly eyes and like what's not to love about cookies. I can't even imagine what it takes to develop a show that has this much staying power. Speaking of staying power, The Gap. The Gap turns 50 as well. 
getting Gap jeans was totally something I had to do in high school. Was it the same for you? I used to ride my bike to the mall, and it was a big deal to get jeans from the Gap. It was such a thing to do in high school. Big memory for me. Here's another good one. The earliest form of the internet appeared 50 years ago, too. Now, I don't know much about anything computer or the internet, so I will not go into details here, but it was on a list. So if you want to learn more about that, just Google it and you will find some great information. Also, the first automatic teller, like the first ATM, uh, also happened 50 years ago. The first one came out in New York. It totally changed banking. I remember driving through. Do you remember that? You'd drive through and then you'd speak in a microphone and then the money would come out in a drawer. The drawer would pop out. Those were the days. And I also remember when I moved to Canada to go to the University of Guelph, they didn't have ATMs, but they got them soon after I was there. So I remember when they were actually installed and you didn't have to go to a teller anymore. So that was the early 80s. Up here, they called them instant tellers, which they still do. So if all of this stuff fascinates you, this giant walk down memory lane, make sure to read up on it some more. I love these articles. There are so many other interesting things on these what's turning 50 this year lists. So if this is up your alley, take a few minutes. It is really fun. But what's really interesting, as usual, is what you make this stuff mean. Just like my personal memorabilia, the way you think about this much time passing by and you being old or older than these iconic things is really where the rubber hits the road. It's funny, when I started thinking about this episode, I looked up the word nostalgia. It means, one, the state of being homesick, homesickness. Or two, a wistful or excessively sentimental yearning for return to or of some past period or irrecoverable condition, right? That's what it means. So when you think about all of this, do you feel wistful or over-the-top sentimental? I would say I don't. For me, I think it's more of a fascination that I've known about things like this as long as I have that I've grown up with them, how much things have changed, and of course, how much things have stayed the same. Lots of changes, though, with the examples I talked about. I I don't feel wistful. Now, I must say, though, that I've had more than one dream about marching band, about having the opportunity to play again like that in a large band on a field, have that experience. But I definitely don't feel that way about most things. Um, For that, I do have intense memories. For sure, it was one of the most influential experiences of my life. But in general, I see that I'm more fascinated than nostalgic. For me, it's more about memorabilia and memories, memorable and noteworthy things. And as a woman in the middle, you've been on the planet long enough now to have memories of all these things. What has all of this made you think about? What's come up for you? Do you keep stuff from your childhood? Are you now thinking about some of your favorite TV shows as a kid? Have you looked up certain episodes with glee? I have. Do you think it's a big deal that these things have turned 50? Like, is that a thing for you? What association do you make that these things have turned 50 and so have you? Or if you haven't yet, you're probably getting closer and closer by the day, uh, literally. (laughs) And the question I want you to really think about is, what can you do to revisit some of the more meaningful memories you have? What I mean is, is there something you want to see again? Is there something you want to learn more about? Is there something you want to find time for? You know me, I'm all about regret-proofing your life, and that means actively looking for ways to make sure that you have more fun so that you don't have regrets about that either. Now's the time, my friend. If you don't have what you want, if there is something you want to see again, if there are things you want to learn more about, if you do want to find more time to do certain things, you got to ask yourself, why aren't you doing it? What is getting in your way? What are your obstacles? that you need to overcome to do what you want. So I really want you to start thinking. It's always good to start thinking. 
but you also have to definitely start doing too. Okay, my friend, that's it for this episode. I hope that I gave you some interesting things to think about. Remember, you're only one thought away from creating what you want in your life. You have to really focus on it though, right? You have to focus on what you want. It does not happen by accident. So keep asking yourself, do you have what you want or are you feeling frustrated and stuck and you just really, really stuck? Maybe even more so than ever before. You might just be ready to make a change. And I want you to have more fun. I want you to be excited about your life. I can totally help you. It's why I get up in the morning, actually. I get really excited about this stuff. (laughs) Just go to www.talktosusie.com and book your free kickstart call. I'm accepting applications to work together right now, and I would love to help you. Let's see if we're a good fit, and we'll take it from there. So if you like what you've heard on today's episode, just head over to the Women in the Middle podcast on iTunes and leave me a review. I totally appreciate the time it takes to do this, but it really does help other women find the podcast and this amazing community too. Check out the show notes with more information and links on my website at www.susierosenstein.com. And while you're there, don't forget to grab your free download, 10 Surprisingly Simple Steps to Bust Out of Your Midlife Funk at www.susierosenstein.com forward slash midlife funk. Let's do this, ladies, one memorable thought at a time. Thanks so much for listening. Mm-hmm.